Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility, an ongoing inquiry into the origins and evolution of American government. The Executive Director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also the host of this discussion, and here he is, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Thank you, Agnes, and welcome to another edition of the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. Today is Tuesday. It is the ninth day of August in the year 2016, and since it is Tuesday, we are beginning our program 30 minutes later uh, than we begin on Mondays and will begin tomorrow on Wednesday. So we have 90 minutes of programming ahead of us. We probably uh, will not need to pause for a for a break. We usually, in our two-hour programs, we usually pause at the top of the second hour uh, to take a four or five-minute break. And uh, on Tuesdays, we've been kind of able to to uh, aw avoid that. And uh, I don't have any problem with breaks. But, uh, you know, the the fact of the matter is two hours for me now is pretty is is pretty much so. But I've so far have been able to make it on Tuesdays for the full 90 minutes. So I'm anticipating that we'll be able to do that today. But if we need a break, I, you, you, I hope you'll understand and we can we can just pause for a minute or two and. And uh, it gives everybody a chance to get a glass of water or, or just to get up and walk around or whatever. And uh, I don't know whether I've said this before, but many of you, I know some of you know this, that uh, uh, when I do these programs, I walk around. I must walk 10 miles over the course of a two, two hour program because I basically I have a little little room here. It's a it's a side porch that was enclosed originally. And so it's it's not very large, but it's a wonderful, wonderful place. Um, I have my books out here and and the computer out here, and I can do the program from here. And I pace back and forth and walk around. And there's four windows in this uh, uh, in this uh, study, and uh, one at either end and two in the middle on the side. And uh, it's fantastic. And I I I, I hadn't even thought of this uh, before, but it's kind of just occurred to me now. But one of the things in higher education that's that's really interesting um, over the years, I, I've it, you know, it's kind of it's kind of a notorious story in higher education. People in higher education know this, that faculty members will jockey with each other for for favorite offices and everybody wants an office with a window. <laughs> and uh, and if you if you happen to to get a corner office with two windows. Uh, one on the back and one on the side. Uh, that was a coup of all coups, you know, and uh, you, you'd be surprised. And that's what the story goes in higher education, that the reason politics is so nasty is because the stakes are so low. Uh, people will kill each other for an office with two windows, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, but the interesting thing is, as I walk around here doing the program and I kind of get into it, every once in a while it will hit me. That I'll say, man, they should see me now. I got four windows, you know. And uh, but anyway, it is a pleasure to be with you uh, on this Tuesday. Um, and uh, I hope that your day is going well. And I hope that for the next 90 minutes or so, we can make it maybe a little bit, maybe even a little bit better. I, I hope that we can contribute to the to the quality of your day. Um, it's a wonderful experience if that if that indeed happens. Um, it's a, it's a tremendous responsibility, and I take it very very seriously. Uh, and that is, if you're willing to give me a portion of your very valuable time, and and it's getting so anymore now that that one's time is one of the most valuable things they have. Everybody seems to want a piece of it, and I know some of you on a regular basis are willing to devote 90 minutes or an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, a couple of days a week to this program. I take that very, very seriously, and I appreciate it so much. And I just hope that I'm able to contribute to making that expenditure of your time worthwhile. And I, I try to do the very best I can, and I hope I hope you will uh, appreciate that. I, I do take that very, very seriously. We would love to hear from you. Yesterday, we did our program on education. Um, and I want to go back to that a little bit today and, and, and kind of wrap up a few things. Um, actually, there's a little bit more than just a few things. But uh, uh, my, my problem with this is that once I get into it, I have a very, very difficult time 
ending it because one thing seems to remind me of something else and and it goes on and on but be that as it may i i'm one of those people and i think you've if you've been with us for any length of time you probably already know that as far as education is concerned to me that's the key uh it's the key to citizenship it's the key to the nature of the republic uh i really believe that and uh i believe that that it's the answer to our problems of economic development growth skill development jobs all of it quality of life all of it and uh i really believe that and i i believe it passionately and i'm hoping that some of that passion comes through in our programs because i i i really believe uh in this uh i couldn't sell cars or houses or or anything else boats or anything else but i can i can talk this game all day because i really believe in it i think it's one of the it's one of the few things that i can think about that don't seem to have doesn't seem to have any negatives to it um everything is positive and uh and there are, there, there don't seem to be any drawbacks so for me it's a win win all the way around because uh you know the amount of time that i spend on it uh if it does improve uh anybody's outlook or anybody's attitude or anything like that uh it's been well worth the expenditure of the of time and effort and uh since i believe in this topic so passionately i think it's the key to the nature of the republic and i think we've seen from madison and hamilton and some of the others the degree to which that's true and the degree to which they appreciated that as well I would love to hear from you. We have a phone number uh and that phone number will get you on the air and that'll give you an opportunity to share your thoughts, concerns, questions, suggestions, whatever whatever's on your mind uh related to our program. It'll give you an opportunity to share your thoughts not only with me but more importantly with other people who are listening as well. And we know that probably the bulk of our listeners uh listen on on uh, iPods or listen on a uh recorded nature they listen they listen at a later date which better fits their schedules and i understand that so i don't really know how many are out there live but i know there are some and i just want you to know how much i appreciate it and i do want you to know that you are always invited to come on the air share your thoughts we can kind of bat a few ideas around i think we'll all learn from it and that in fact that's one of the things that uh that I want to touch on today when we go back to our topic. Our phone number is area code 304-663-4676. 304-663-4676. If you'd like to share your thoughts with me in an email, uh I would appreciate hearing from you that way. I will obviously take avail myself of the opportunity if it should arise to Uh, share your thoughts as expressed in the email with our listeners on a on a program uh the next day or the day after that and uh because if you've got something that I really believe our listeners could benefit from then I I don't want to deny them the opportunity that's the whole point of a program like this is the interaction and the discussion everybody learns something they didn't know before and uh so I again I I think it's a it's a win-win all the way around Um my email address is waobrian906 at gmail.com. That's waobrian o b r i e n 906 at gmail.com. And again I do uh call your attention to our Facebook page. Uh we've had it now probably for about 7 months. We continue to get uh increased numbers of likes. um and uh increase numbers of comments uh on some of the things that are there I do encourage you to to check out on a regular basis our Facebook page because I try to uh take my thoughts when I'm really into something I usually try to uh express it on Facebook while it's fresh in my mind and so sometimes there'll be two or three day a day where I'll be on Facebook two or three different times 
posting something about about a topic, uh, you know, m- much, most of the time related to, to obviously the political situation, but not always. And um, but if you are a regular user of Facebook, just go to the home page and in the search box at the top, just type in the virtual center for the study of the Constitution and you will be onto our Facebook page. After yesterday's program, last e- early last evening, I did post a little bit of our program yesterday on our Facebook page. And the reason for it, not only that it was fresh in my mind, and not only that I really think and thought that it was relevant, but the mere fact that I did think it was relevant, I wanted to capture it. I didn't want to let the opportunity pass by for trying to capture a little bit of the of the enthusiasm and passion, if you will, um, that um, came out of yesterday's program. You'll recall that we we were talking about higher education and we were talking about engaging content. And as a lead into yesterday's program, I made the point that in previous programs for we've been doing uh, we've been on education now for the last four or five programs and I've been making the statement about engaging content, engaging material over and over again and saying it's the engagement with material that constitutes the education. The content itself is not the the education. What happens to you as as a person who's affected by that content? That's the education, the growth within you, as it were. And what we were looking at um, is the Yale faculty, because in 1828, the Yale faculty issued a formal report in which they tried to explain why they believed the way they approach education was the right way and why they were not willing to give in to the pressures of changing the curriculum in order to better fit the demands of a growing mercantile commercial society. This was the early 19th century. Commerce, business was on the move, and many of the eastern cities in the United States Uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Baltimore, Annapolis, uh, uh, along northern Virginia, Alexandria, for example, um, Philadelphia, Camden, New Jersey, Providence, Rhode Island, um, Newport, Rhode Island, Boston, you know, the, the, the port cities, if you will, were growing and within them, the, the power the significant factor in most of those commercial centers was the emergence of a vibrant, dynamic, aggressive group of people whose lives were totally devoted to the commercial expansion that were taking place. That would, they were merchants, they were shipbuilders, they were insurance folks, they were investors, they were bankers, um, they were uh, brokers who uh, many of them would buy agricultural products from the interior, uh, move them to the coast, load them on ships, and sell them overseas. And these people were making, as the nation began to grow in the early 19th century, these people were doing well financially. And one of the things they realized, and of course among them early on was Benjamin Franklin, um, in the late 18th century, Benjamin Franklin, even though it was early, began to see the potential here. And Benjamin Franklin was one of those people that lobbied hard for adjustments in college curriculums in order to reflect the demands of a dynamic commercial marketplace. And his feeling was that what we teach in college needs to be more useful. It needs to fit or accommodate more directly the business needs of of people who are going to be devoting their lives 
to the economic expansion that was taking place in early America. He believed that education needed to support that and that it was necessary to make sure that students were given the information that they could use rather than continue to base college education on a much more classical education, probably uh, characterized by more than anything else by, the, by foreign languages and especially by classical languages, by, by Greek and, and uh, Latin. And, you know, and many of the best colleges and universities required all undergraduates to take courses in Latin and Greek. And many people in this new commercial environment began to question the value of these ancient languages. And the argument is, why should we continue to spend so much time teaching things in our colleges that students won't ever use when we could better use that time by giving them what, we, what they need? something that's more useful, more practical. In a sense, then, what these people were asking for was that colleges and these colleges and universities become more like professional schools. And the Yale faculty believed that the professions needed to remain at the graduate level. In other words, they needed to be where you went after you finished your undergraduate education. The purpose of undergraduate education, of a college education, was to educate the individual, educate the students. Once educated, then they could turn to the various professions, whether it was the law, medicine, uh, or whatever it might, banking, finance, whatever it might be and specialize then. But it was that kind of pressure that prompted the Yale faculty to put together what we know, uh, what, what they call the Yale Report. And it's a fairly extensive report of how they teach, what they do and why they do it, and what they believe their job is and what they believe their job is not. And the point that I was making yesterday was that we would be hard put to find people who know the animal better, who know the, the, the field of education better than the faculty at Yale. That was true then and it's true today. So the question that I raised yesterday is why in God's world would we not take seriously the advice and the information shared with us by the Yale faculty on how we try to do what we do better than anybody else, which is teach college students. But for reasons which we won't necessarily go into now, but I think we've touched on them off and on, through the weeks and months here at the virtual center that we've been kind of dancing around this whole issue. The fact of the matter is there are interests, there are specific interests and specific people who have a vested interest in not doing what the Yale faculty recommended in terms of education. Part of it is because they really believe, and of course the Yale faculty believe this as well, that these kinds of skills, this level of education, was something that only the best students could handle. This wasn't an education for the masses. This was education for the leadership. This was the creme de la creme of education for the creme de la creme of society, if that makes sense. 
and they believe that it would be a waste of time to expose the masses to this because they couldn't handle it. But even that is probably a, a, an excuse more than a reason. Because the fact of the matter is, they didn't want the masses to be able to handle it. By definition, the reason these people were part of what we call the masses is because they didn't have this information. I guess what I'm saying is there's a major conundrum, a major conflict, a major contradiction in our history of education. Because at the same time that we committed to educate all of our people and to give all of our people the benefit of access to education, at the very same time we were doing that, we were manipulating or adjusting the level of education available in order to fit the masses, in order to accommodate the fact that we believed going in, we assumed that these people were not going to be able to handle the levels of thinking and analysis that we were expecting the few to handle. This is very clear in the Yale report. One of the elements of the engagement we looked at yesterday, we looked at the six steps that the Yale report laid out for engaging content. And the last one was rousing and guiding the powers of genius. The Yale faculty really believed that if there was genius, if there were geniuses within the student body, chances were, chances are that they would most likely be at Yale. And what they wanted to do was use this approach to education in order to light a fire under these particular people so that their genius would show. And they would stand out from the crowd, even though the crowd were, the, were, were, were students at Yale. In other words, even though the student body at Yale was a select group, it wasn't a random group, it was a very selective group. But these faculty members believed that even within that group, there were people who couldn't cut it, who didn't belong there. And they saw it as their job to blow, those, the, the, blow the cover of those people, identify them, and get rid of them. So the, one, of the, one of the lines in the Yale report, one of the statements they make in the Yale report is that part of their job is to rouse the genius within the group. But in the course of rousing the genius that's there, they're also identifying the lack of genius that's there. In other words, not only are they discovering the talent, the, the most talent within a talented group, but they're also discovering the lack of talent within that group. Because realistically, while the students at Yale came from the wealthiest families, the best families, that didn't automatically mean that they all had talent. I guess what I would say is if one were going to try to explain the assumptions they made, I would say that their assumptions were that if there's genius, it's within this particular class. It's among the few. But just because you come from that class doesn't automatically mean that you have genius within you. And so this faculty's job, they felt, 
was not only to identify the genius, but also identify those within the group who couldn't cut it and didn't belong there. Those who tested and showed themselves to be dull and uncreative, uninventive, non-creative. But the general assumption was that if there was talent in society, it was going to be in that group. And what we did as a republic was to commit to the idea that in our society, which is built, our constitutional system built on the idea of liberty, of individual freedom and opportunity, that everybody needs to have the access to education because everybody has a right to the opportunity. But driving the whole the whole idea was the assumption that the the realization, Jefferson, you can see this in Jefferson, the realization that there could be talent within the masses, but likely it was in the minority. In other words, there wasn't much of it, but it, it could be there. And the system of education he proposed, the competition but, uh, you know, forcing competition among students was a way for the talent to show the, the, by selecting the boy of best genius every year. What you're doing is creating a competitive environment so that the talent will show. But among the masses, you're, ex you're, you're assuming that the talent is going to be limited and most of the students are just going to be average or slow. That was the assumption, and that's the assumption that the Yale faculty made as well. This is the assumption that we have got to get beyond if we're going to really reform our economic system into the engine for economic development that Jim Justice and many other leaders expect it to be. It is my position, and the research that's been done reinforces this, that this kind of education, which has traditionally been reserved only for the few, is not the way to turn education into a contributing factor to the, the economic engine we've been talking about. It's the only way. Because as we, as we spoke yesterday, there's no way we can predict change before it happens. There's no way we can anticipate the skills, the specific skills, that people are going to need for jobs that don't even exist yet. So by definition, the way we've been approaching education can't work. The Yale's faculty approach to position, however, is the only thing that can work. Because what they were talking about was teaching students to teach themselves. Creating self-learners by teaching them how to learn. So that as these people continue to encounter challenges and change throughout their lives... They can handle it. They can master it. It doesn't overwhelm them. They overwhelm it. The only way to prepare for a dynamic, changing future is to prepare the people that you teach to handle it. And the only way to do that is to adopt this model. And that means that many of the things that we take for granted in the way we educate our young people, both in the K through 12 level and at the college and university level, need to be rethought. And the first major change, the first major challenge 
to the assumptions that have driven our approach to education throughout is that only the few can do it. Only the few can be are sharp enough to be well educated. Only a few people are born with the skills and the talents necessary to really benefit from a high quality education. And society's job is to find those people. And the only way you can do it is to set up your education, your school system, in such a way that students are forced to compete with each other so that those who make the decisions for society, the schools and the teachers and the administrators and the counselors and all the rest of it, will be able to know who has the potential and who doesn't have the potential. And then the next step is to readjust education to better fit the skills and the talents of your students. If you can organize your educational process in such a way that you separate students by ability, where you have the brightest students in one class and students that aren't quite as bright in another class, and students who are very slow in yet another class. And you can teach all the slow people together. Then you can readjust curriculum to better fit their potential. What you are doing by individualizing instruction in this way, this is what traditionally Progressive educators, so-called progressive educators, used to call student-centered education, adjusting the educational demands to the abilities of the student. And so the whole idea was that the more we could, we could spiffy up, the more we could professionalize our ability to test and to identify demand, to identify skills and potential, the better we could be at placing students in the right place. And of late, many people have begun to complain about this and said, but this isn't really right because our schools have to prepare people for life. And life isn't organized into ability groups. Everybody is going to have to interact with people who are a lot smarter than they are or who are a lot slower than they are. And everybody's going to have to figure out a way to adjust to that. So the criticism of progressive student-centered education for a long time was that it was make-believe. It was artificial. It really didn't prepare people for life because life isn't the way the schools organize themselves to pretend that life, you know, to pretend how life was. It wasn't that way. But the fact of the matter is what we do in, in organizing or manipulating curriculum to fit the abilities of students, what we're doing is denying all students the opportunity to shine. We are denying students the opportunity for their real talents and real abilities to come through. What we have to do instead is teach people to the highest standards we're able to, to teach. We've got to keep the bar high. And we've got to find ways to get students to try to make that bar. Some will do it easily. Some will do it only with struggle. Some will almost do it, but never quite make it. And some won't even come close. But the fact of the matter is, in the process, all will learn if we give them the opportunity to learn. That's equality of opportunity. And that's what we've gotten away from. 
And that's what we need to get back to, I think. Let me share with you, I've got a copy of the Yale report in my hand. And I wanted to share with you, I had quotes, I, I ex, you know, extracted a few lines and quotes on what I thought were key phrases and, and, and sentences from the Yale report uh, and, and shared them with you. But it dawned on me last evening that if you read the whole, I don't mean the whole document, it's too long. But if you read certain key passages, you begin to get a flavor for what these people are trying to do. So let me, let me share with you a couple of paragraphs. And what I'm asking you to do is just kind of listen and reflect on what they're saying. Because given the preparation we've already done here, you're going to not be surprised by what they say. You have a pretty good idea of what this is going to be. But I want you to kind of get the flavor of how they say it, how they explain it. Because I think they make their case better than I can make their case. Here's a paragraph that I think is, is pretty relevant. The collegiate course of study, the curriculum, the collegiate course of study, we hope, may be carefully distinguished from several other objects and plans with which it has been too often confounded. We've got to, what they're meaning is, we've got to make sure that the college course of study that we're about here at Yale doesn't get all confused and blended with all of these other things. And, of course, what they're mainly interested in is the pressure for more practical or useful education. It is far from embracing everything which the student will ever have occasion to learn. Important. What they're saying is, we know that what we're doing in four years is not in any way an effort to teach them everything they'll need to know. We can't do that. It's far, our curriculum, is, our course of study, is far from embracing everything which the student will ever have occasion to learn. The object is not to finish his education, but to lay the foundation and to advance as far in rearing the superstructure as the short period of his residence here will admit. If he acquires here a thorough knowledge of the principles of science, he may then, in great measure, educate himself. He has at least been taught how to learn. With the aid of books and means of observation, he may be constantly advancing in knowledge. Wherever he goes, into whatever company he falls, he has those general views on every topic of interest, which will enable him to understand to digest and to form a correct opinion on the statements and discussions which he hears. Our job is to equip students to become self-learners. Our job is not to teach them everything they'll need to know. Our job is to prepare them to learn whatever they encounter that they may need to know. What I wanted to emphasize in this particular paragraph that I've shared with you is the idea of what they call a thorough knowledge of the principles of science. What they are saying is that what we know about learning, what we know about the, brain, the way the brain functions, what we know about how students learn, tells us that there's a way to teach. And that's what we're about. Our job is to introduce the kind of content, the kind of material or information that's going to cause 
that learning to happen. In other words, what they're saying is all content isn't the same. That there are certain things that educated people need to know. Because only when they know it can they continue to learn for the rest of their lives based on it. In other words, by knowing the foundation, they're able to build on that foundation for the rest of their lives. Our job is to make sure they've got the foundation, not that they know everything. If we take this out of 1828, out of the period when they wrote it, into today and begin to look at some of the research today in higher education, what they're basically saying is that everything we learn is connected to what we already know. Learning is a process. It's a process of building upon a foundation. You've got to lay the foundation, and then you've got to introduce the kinds of things that are going to allow that foundation to grow and expand and become more solid, more stable. What that means is, and what our research has come to tell us, is there are, thir there are certain things that educated people need to know. Because they are critical in understanding and being able to learn things that are based on or built upon those particular things. That's what organizing a curriculum was about. What we've had, what we've experienced in our society generally, I'm not going to get into specifics here, but I think you'll know what I'm talking about. We've, we've run into situations in this country in recent years where everybody in the world believes that they have a right to decide what ought to be in the course, in courses, part of the curriculum. We believe that we know what colleges ought to teach. And we use our influence, our political clout, our money to force students to teach what we want them to teach. And the reason we believe we're able to do that is because we believe that education is really going to take only for the brightest kids anyway. The brightest kids are going to end up being bright kids. So in other words, what we want to make sure is they know what we want them to know. But what the Yale faculty is telling us is there are certain things that all students must know if they're going to become educated. And we are the professionals. We know what those things are. You don't. Politician. President of the Senate, Speaker of the House, corporate interests, Koch brothers, all of those people that would pour resources and browbeat and bribe institutions of higher education into teaching their curriculum. What they're saying is, what is in the curriculum doesn't matter. We can teach any damn thing we want kids to know, and this is what we want them to know. And what the Yale faculty is saying is, oh, no, that ain't true. There are certain things, there's certain kinds of knowledge that make it possible to continue to add to that knowledge for the rest of your life. And if you deny it, if you exclude it from the curriculum in favor of what the Koch brothers want, for example, you're going to get believers in the mantra of what they want taught.
in their case, it's about free enterprise and liberty and small government and all that other stuff. Well, they're going to get that. But in the process, their education is going to be deficient. Because they'll be substituting that stuff for the stuff that they really need to know, need to have. In other words, what the Yale faculty is talking about is what we call today a core curriculum. There's a certain body of knowledge in a variety of different areas that need to comprise the college curriculum. If it's there, and if it's properly taught, then the students that come out of that experience will be educated students in the sense that they will be learners for the rest of their lives. All they need to know then, all they need to do then as change happens, is go back and pick up the specifics. Because they'll know how to handle those specifics. Because they've learned the core. And what that means is everything is based on everything else. Let me go back to the text of the Yale report. What they do in the next paragraph after the one I just read is to argue against the idea of what they call professional studies. This course of study that we do here for undergraduates is not designed to include professional studies. What the Yale faculty is saying is it's exactly not that. Our object is not to teach that which is peculiar to any one of the professions, but to lay the foundation which is common to them all. So what they are saying here is that they, they're telling us that they believe that there are certain fundamental principles of learning that are common to all the professions. And if you spend your time imposing one particular profession, at the expense of the foundation, then what you're turning out are brainwashed believers, but not learners. The Yale faculty says there are separate schools for medicine, law, and theology connected with the college, as well as in various parts of the country which are open for the reception of all who are prepared to enter upon the appropriate studies of their several professions. With these, the academic course is not intended to interfere. That's not what we're about, the Yale faculty says. But then they go on. But why, it may be asked, should a student waste his time on studies which have no immediate connection to his future profession. Will chemistry enable him to plead at the bar? Or conic sections qualify him for preaching? Or astronomy aid him in the practice of physics? Why should not his attention be confined to the subject which is to occupy the labors of his life? In answer to this, the Yale faculty says, it may be observed that there is no science which does not contribute its aid to professional skill. Everything throws light upon everything. What a line. Everything throws light upon everything. All knowledge is interconnected. The great object of a collegiate education preparatory to the study of a profession 
is to give that expansion and balance of the mental powers, those liberal and comprehensive views, and those fine proportions of character, which are not to be found in him whose ideas are always confined to one particular channel. If you focus on one particular profession, you're turning out an imbalanced student, a student who only knows one thing and is ignorant in other things. And what the Yale faculty says is in the circles that our students are going to travel in, their ignorance is going to betray them. They will not be able to make it among educated people because their narrowness, their lack of understanding and breadth is going to be visible. They won't be able to hide it. They'll only know one thing. And that's all. And we don't want that. They're talking about the narrowness in habits of thinking. A peculiarity of character which will be sure to mark him as a man of limited views and attainments. For what purpose then, the faculty says, and I'll stop with this paragraph. For what purpose, then, will it will be asked, are young men who are destined to these occupations ever sent to a college? If they're going to be lawyers or doctors or, or pastor, preachers, why should they go to college at all? They should not be sent, as we think, with an ex with an ex expectation of finishing their education at the college, but with a view of laying a thorough foundation in the principles of science preparatory to the study of the practical arts. As everything cannot be learned in four years, either theory or practice must be, in a measure at least, postponed to a future opportunity. But if the scientific theory of the arts is ever to be acquired, it is unquestionably first in order of time. In other words, the, the college education, the college years, the undergraduate years, is the only time that this important instruction, this important part of the foundation of a well-educated person can be laid. If it's not done here... They're not going to get it. So basically, that's what this report is about. That's what they're telling us. All right, let's go back to the challenge at hand. The fact that we live in a world, I'm speaking in from West Virginia, where this is absolutely dire need. But all of us are living in a world where the skill demands are much greater and much more intense than they've ever been before. And fewer and fewer people are being able to meet those demands. In other words, the education system as such is deficient. It's not preparing people for the skill demands they're going to need in the developing 21st century world. So we've got to find a way to turn education from a hindrance into an asset. As Jim Justice said in his campaign for governor here in West Virginia, we have got to begin to invest in education and make education part of the economic engine that drives the turnaround here in this state. And this is true in every state. The only way to do that is to make people self-learners, is to prepare people for the unknown 
prepare people to master, to handle change. So that change doesn't defeat them. Change merely challenges them. And they ultimately have the skills necessary to master it. And what research is telling us is that everybody can do this. Everybody can't do it to the same level. We know that. Everybody can't be an Einstein. But everybody can learn. Those who are incapable of learning are in institutions. Let's face it. Because if you can't learn, you can't survive in the modern world. You can't drive the highways. You can't read the maps. You can't tell time. You can't navigate the internet. You can't navigate a supermarket. If you're given 10 items to find in a supermarket... And you walk in there, and in your mind, it's total chaos. Nothing is organized. Everything is at random. And the only way you can find your ten items is to go up one aisle and down the other, all the way through the store until you find the item you're looking for, and then go back to the building and do it all over again for the next item. That's the only way you can do it. But if you understand that the store is organized and that like products are in the same place and like products are connected to similar products and all the cereals are in one aisle and all the soap powders are in another aisle and all the dish detergent is another aisle and all the bathing soap is in another aisle and all the coffee and tea is in another aisle and all the soda pop is in its own aisle and the chips are in its own aisle. I'm kind of basically this is my shopping. I'm giving you you pretty well know what I buy. But seriously then you know that if it's a box of cereal you got to find, you know which aisle to go to. If you didn't, you'd never get out of that store. Don't tell me you can't learn. Of course you can learn. Everybody can learn. What this is is a formula to give everybody the opportunity to fulfill their God-given potential. It's the only thing that can do that. The way we're doing it now by comparing people to other people, comparing students to other students, one class to another class, one school to another school, one county school system to another school system, one state system to another system, one nation's education system to other nations. What all of that does is based is all of that is based on the fact that it's only through the competition that talent and potential surfaces and becomes visible and measurable. But the fact of the matter is if we're educating students if we are really committed to the goal of educating our people, then what that means is we need to educate them into the process of learning so that when they leave us, they know how to learn whatever they encounter, wherever it might be, in whatever, whatever setting they might find themselves. That's the American dream. That's the republic. That's the nature of an informed, responsible citizenship. That's the basis of a healthy, positive interaction between voters and candidates, between elected representatives and the people they represent. That's the very nature of Republican government that Madison and Hamilton and, and Jefferson and all the rest of them talked about. That's it. 
And to a degree, everybody can do it. The mere fact that they find their way to class in the morning, that they're able to get on the school bus and get to class, and when school ends to get back on the right bus and go home, indicates that they can learn, they can think. If there's a storm and the roads are icy and the buses can't make it on a particular road, they come up with an alternative route. And you'll hear on the radio in the morning, those scheduled to get the 10, the number 13 bus or the number 15 bus can pick it up this morning at such and such a place, regular than the normal place. And you can adjust to that. You know what that means. It doesn't mean, oh my God, there's change. I can't function. I can't go out. I have to sit here and cover my head and not move because everything's changing. Everything that I thought I knew has moved. No. You make accommodations. You make adjustments. That's learning. And we can all do it. But naturally, some people are going to do it more effectively than others. Some people are going to be able to go to, to, to refine or to milk a subject to the depths of its meaning much deeper than others. Some people are going to have the breadth we're talking about depth. Depth is how far in. Breadth is how wide. We're going to have people that are able to take learning and apply it to different situations. And say, well, if this situation is true, how would that help me understand Donald Trump's campaign? Here's an article on psychopathic behavior. This is the way a psychopath would talk. Read it. Do I understand it? Well, let's see if I understand it. Let's see if it helps me understand the way Donald Trump is running his campaign. And if you can take these two seemingly unrelated concepts and connect them and link them to the point that you can use one to help you understand the other. Then your potential for learning is much greater than those that have trouble doing that. But to a degree, everyone can do it. And I think that's what we need to begin to do. So the fact of the matter is, if education is really going to become part of the so-called economic engine that turns the economy around and gives everybody the opportunity to participate constructively in a growing, expanding, diversifying economy, then we need to begin to, to structure education, to approach education this way. We've got to get away from the idea that we need to make sure that students believe and know what we want them to know and what we want them to believe. And instead, we've got to teach them how to learn and trust that they will be able to teach themselves. And we've talked about this before. There's danger there. Because once you make the switch, once you make the change from controlling what students believe to teaching them how to learn and developing their own belief system, then you must pretty well live with the consequences. Once you trust people to become learners 
and make the decision to let them learn, then you surrender the right to control what they learn or what they believe. You enable them to be on their own. And you've got to live, be willing to live with the consequences. I would suggest that a lot of us have not been willing to make that concession, to make that leap. I believe that the opposition to the common core is in part based on the fact that if we do this, all hell's going to break out. We'll be educate. We'll be graduating kids from school, and we won't have any idea what they're learning or what they believe or what they know or anything else. In order to protect ourselves and protect the future, we've got to make sure that when they graduate, they respect us and who we are and what we've got. And what I'm saying is, if you insist on that, then the only way to do it is not let them become self-learners, is to deny them the opportunities inherent in a good education. And you can color it any way you want, but that's what you're doing. You are making decisions that affect people's lives for their entire life. You are denying them experiences and opportunities and you'll never know they'll never know what they could have done and what they could have known because you made the decision that they weren't able to handle it or you were afraid to let them try my god that's awful if you put it in those terms But I think what we need to do is rethink the traditional ideas, the traditional things that people say about education and about learning. Education is a waste of time. School's dull. Learning is dull. Reading is dull. I don't read a book because I'm too busy. I don't have time. Everything I need to know, I know now. Nobody needs to teach me anything else. I know everything I need to know. Think about that. And think about how prevalent it is in our society for people to believe that, even if sometimes, if, even if they won't acknowledge it or admit it. So the fact of the matter is, If we're going to turn education into the engine that it can become, then we've got some major decisions to make, it seems to me, and some major reforms to make in the way we look at education at all levels. I don't want to spend a lot of time. We don't have a lot of time left in today's program, but I don't want to spend a lot of time anyway, specifically on higher education. But let me share with you some of the problems, a few of the problems that make this difficult. Over the years, it seems to me, higher education has been able to win the freedom and independence from outside interference that this process would require. In other words, if you think about it, everybody who's talking about the importance of education, everybody rec re recognizes that if the economy is going to grow and if jobs are going to happen and if the standard of living and the quality of life and a particular reason is going to, to go up, then higher education is going to be directly involved in that. 
throughout the nation, the places people most want to live, where the property values are highest, where the schools are the best, are places with major research universities and capabilities. Madison, Wisconsin, Columbus, Ohio, Stanford, Atlanta, Boston. Basically, an environment like this draws people. It's not an area that young people look forward to leaving. It's the kind of an area that young people look forward to coming to and raising their children there. It's where I want to raise my kids. My, I want my kids exposed to classical music, to the symphony, to the arts, to theater, to dance, to good literature, to high-powered lectures. And I'm willing to pay for the opportunities or the benefits of raising my children in that kind of an environment. If you talk about turning around education, that's the environment you're talking about creating. Here in West Virginia, what you're saying is no longer is West Virginia going to be a place that people leave and can't wait to get out of. We're going to turn education into a place that people want to come to, that people want to live in, that people want to retire in. What this suggests is that higher education institutions, colleges and universities have a major role to play in the quality of life within the communities in which they're located. They are vital to the economic livelihood of their communities because they have a responsibility to affect, to impact the community in all of these areas because they make it happen. It's the fact that they're there that it does happen. That means that colleges and universities have a community responsibility. They have a public responsibility. Their responsibility doesn't end where the campus begins or the campus ends. But what we've done as a society over the years, we have respected their need for independence so that a true environment of learning and free speech and exchange of ideas and research and new knowledge can happen. So unfailingly, political leaders have been reluctant to interfere with the internal workings of colleges and universities. What they say is that the college and university is vital to what we want to do, but we have no option except to trust you, the professionals, to make it happen, to do it. It seems to me then that places on colleges and universities an incredible social responsibility to the communities within which they're located, to the states which fund them, to the, pack, to the taxpayers who pay their salaries. The purpose of a higher education institution, it seems to me, is yes, to educate students, but to do it in a way that creates benefits for the entire community. You're turning out students who can be competitive everywhere, anywhere but who want to raise their children 
in the community they're in or a community like that. And that's what the taxpayers are paying these institutions to do. Not educate students so that they can leave and never come back. Which unfortunately too often is what's happening. I believe that many of our colleges and universities are shortchanging the communities they live in, they're located in. A short ta- pay, a short changing the faculties or the taxpayer, excuse me, the, the taxpayers who are paying the salaries and building the buildings. And I believe that colleges and universities that build, and this is going to sound like Donald Trump, and I don't mean it to, but those institutions that build walls in order to isolate the campus from interference from the outside. That's all well and good, provided what's happening inside is ultimately going to benefit the community. But if it's not, then it seems to me the community has some sort of right, since they're paying the bills or many of the bills, to ask why. I guess what I'm saying is part of this economic engine building is to create a a sense, a much more vibrant, vital sense of public and community responsibility here so that institutions will recognize that their obligations and responsibilities don't end, end with the classroom. And their, their day, their day of professional, of, of professionalism doesn't end when their last class ends. They have responsibilities beyond the immediate. Granted, they're not direct responsibilities so much. They're, in, they're indirect. But they are there. And it seems to me we're going to have to begin to insist that these institutions fulfill those obligations and those responsibilities. Why does it appear that I'm beating on colleges and universities? I'm not. I love them. My my whole life has been devoted to this. College and universities continue to compete for the best students. They believe that their academic standards, their reputations, their ability to attract the brightest students depends on the quality of the students they graduate. They spend incredible amounts of money to recruit academic superstars the high school valedictorians and salutatorians, the top two or three graduating seniors in every high school in the region. But the problem is that there are more colleges and universities than there are salutatorians and valedictorians. And what that means is If these institutions are going to keep their enrollments up, if they're going to justify the size of their budgets by making sure that they continue to to educate as many students as they were budgeted to educate, or preferably more, then they're going to have to go far and wide in order to find the quality students. The point I'm making here is that what that fact signifies is that the institutions have conver- have confused ends and means. The reason they were created as public institutions 
And the reason that public tax money was allocated to their support is because of their responsibilities to the community. Because of what they were expected to do and accomplish by being there. Not only for the people who go there, the students, but for the entire communities around them. The whole quality of life of the region should be enhanced because they're there and they do what they do. That's why the public's expenditure of tax revenue, which is becoming more and more scarce, is a wise expenditure. But when institutions spend that money, tax money, to, to hire recruiters to go far and wide into other states, other nations, other parts of the world, in order to recruit qualified students, in order to make sure that they enroll the number of students that the budget says they have to enroll, then the institution is placing its own priorities ahead of the public interest. It originally was created as a means to an end. Now it is operating as if it is the end in itself. That the most important thing to the state and the region is the continuation of the college and the continued growth of the college. And in order to do that, we'll recruit students from far and wide in order to meet, meet the numbers that we need to enroll. But the fact of the matter is, the hundreds and thousands of local people who are in need of educational services are being overlooked are being denied, are not being recruited, are not being served because, quote, they aren't qualified. They don't meet the standards. It seems to me that this creates an ethical conflict, a moral conflict, or it ought to. And I believe it's time that institutions began to address this need for the 40 and 50 and 60 percent of the adult populations that live in these communities that are deficient in skills, that can't get jobs, that can't even compete for good jobs. that are unemployed, that are looking for ways to get on the public role, to, to begin to collect disability. And these become drags on the economy of the region. How does the economy of a region or a state grow and expand when it has this anchor this growing number of adults who can't contribute to the quality of life in the community, but in fact detract from it because they, caught, they require too many resources. They require food subsidies, health care subsidies, housing subsidies, electricity uh, subsidies. Subsidizing their cell phones and all the rest of it. They inhibit the ability of communities, of entire economies, to grow together. And the only way to change it is to deliver the educational services to them that they so desperately need. But the institutions being funded to do that won't do it because they don't feel they can do it. It would jeopardize their standards. It would cost them 
foundation dollars. It would cost them scholarships. It would cost them research grants. It would cost them their reputations. It would mean that some of the best students with they, which they look to recruit would go elsewhere rather than there because there were too many, quote, average students there. So institutions don't feel that they can do this. It seems to me there is the challenge for education's challenge to become part of the economic engine in order to turn faltering economies around. And that is to find a way to serve all the people, not just a few of the people. And that's quite a change from what education in this society has traditionally been about. And what I'm saying is it's not that you take education in a totally different direction from the highest quality education, which is what Yale University, what the Yale faculty was talking about 200 years ago. Rather, what you do is you find a way to so maneuver and adjust the best quality education and find ways to teach it to all of your people. And when you do that, the entire economy, the entire region moves forward together. Everybody benefits from it. Jobs appear. Crime lessens. People's inclination to turn to drugs and alcohol tends to disappear. People have meaningful jobs to go to on a day-to-day -day basis. They can't afford to do drugs or to drink excessively. And many of the problems that soak up so much of our scarce resources would take care of themselves. It seems to me that while this is difficult and involves some substantial changes, the fact of the matter is it's a change that we can't not do. We have got to find ways to make it work. And I think all of us need to spend as much time as we can evaluating and assessing some of these principles and some of these issues. I'm not claiming to have all of the answers. I'm not claiming that the Yale faculty has all the answers. But I think we would be, we would be crazy to deny that they had many of the answers. Because they were turning out the best students then and they're doing the same thing today. They're doing something right. And too many of our young people are being denied access to it. And they don't even have any idea what opportunities are not coming their way. Because of the hang-ups of many of the people who are making the decisions for them. I don't think this is negative or depressing at all. I think this is very exciting. I think it opens up all sorts of possibilities and directions. And I, I just hope that you'll agree. I mean, I didn't think that necessarily that we would take the balance of our entire program today in, in, on this topic, but we have. We're, we're at 59 minutes after the hour, so we've really completed our full time together today on this particular topic. But it's over. And I promise tomorrow that when we come back, I'm not going to begin with another hour on higher education, at least not for a while. But I want to thank you for tuning in. I want to encourage you to invite your friends to join, to join us. I, I really do hope that more and more people become aware of what we're trying to do here. 
I hope that you have a wonderful evening. Please be kind to each other. And God willing, we'll be back together again tomorrow. This is Bill O'Brien. Thank you so very much. Have a good day. Thank you.